co-chair, uh, Pete Saronis. Um, you guys know from Dots and Bridges, 25-year federal uh, servant, uh, many administrations, many senior leadership positions. Um, I'm going to turn it over to him here in a second to uh, moderate our discussion, but we have two guests that I'm really excited to hear from. Um, first, uh, Dan McConnell. Uh, he's the chief uh, technologist at Booz Allen Hamilton's Bright Labs uh, up in the D.C. area where they do emerging research and development technology. Um, primarily, he is working on uh, extended reality, digital twins, and metaverse capabilities. Um, Dan's also worked at the Cohen Group uh, and is a former infantry officer uh, in the 10th Mountain Division, um, and so is just an all-around excited to hear some of the things that they're up to. And then our second person, uh, Raimundo Rodolfo uh, from the City of Coral Gables. Um, he has been with City of Coral Gables since 2004, done a lot of really, really, really cool stuff. Currently, the Director of Innovation and Technology and the Chief Innovation Officer, where he has uh, this, he and the city both have won uh, multiple awards for the work that they've been doing. Uh, prior to coming to Coral Gables, he's had several years in industry, uh, in the telecom space, uh, working for major companies and major role and rollouts of large projects uh, across the country. So I am excited to hear from both of you guys. Pete, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, and get started with our panelists. I I appreciate that. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, and Mike, thank you. I, I It's neat to be introduced. And uh, thank you for uh, not starting with, you know, Pete was the former CTO at the Department of Energy eight years ago. But no, I had a wonderful, wonderful 25 year run in government. What a what an amazing place to work. And with ACT IAC, when I was in federal, to be in a community like this, a trusted environment where public and private partnership come together today is hopefully indicative of that. And a uh, Got to give shout outs to Nancy, Rob, Todd, Mike, Sam, Don, Jackie, and everyone else behind the scenes who have helped make this happen. We hope for the next 40 minutes or so, we enlighten, educate, and inform you on, yes, a lot of things. Smart cities, IoT, challenges, barriers, opportunities. We're blessed to have Raimundo and Dan here, two amazing thought leaders. And while Mike gave a little bit of a background, before I jump into just bragging a little bit about them, I want to remind people that the slide you saw about our working group within the Emerging Tech COI is very focused on infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and how the IoT, the Internet of Things, and the Industrial Internet of Things, the IIoT, are helping serve or underpin uh, the, the uh, anatomy of a smart city and what it takes, because it's people, process, and technology. Uh, we hope that uh, you are interested in more of these types of events. We're always looking for amazing speakers who have real life uh, impact in outside the beltway beyond the regulation. We are a venue where members can hear about the latest. I'm reading a little bit off of our, our statement here at ACTIAC, and we always look to help develop resources for adoption. It could be knowledge, it could be a product, and, and please, please join us. Uh, today's topic is a uh, very, very important phrase. Enhancing digital equity, collaborative innovation, and economic growth, something that these two gentlemen will absolutely address. This is not just about tech, because tech's not the problem. A smart city is the compilation of digitally connected people, information, and urban elements. While the technologies underpin these communities are in a consistent and continuous state of evolution, the objective is to ensure a citizen-oriented approach to city management, expanding community collaboration, embracing diversity and inclusivity, and a lot of other great stuff. We hope to mitigate risk when we build smart cities. We hope to dispel myth when we develop smart cities and importantly, educate the masses. So with all of that, Ramundo is a colleague and yes, Director of Innovation and Technology, Chief Innovation Officer, City of Coral Gables. Amazing, amazing individual. His roots are in telecom folks. Read his pedigree online since the 90s. He and I are of the same age. So we remember when there wasn't an internet. He's been with Coral Gables since 2004 and he's giving some great presentations later today. Uh, he was just for our ACTI community hanging out with our good buddy Bill, Bill Zielinski recently. He's a Master of Science, uh, a Bachelor of Science, and these are in things at the Florida International University, Electronics and Engineering from National Polytech. He, he, he has his background in how this stuff works, just to, and also a Six Sigma black belt. So if those of you who know what that is, that's pretty darn impressive. And equally impressive is my buddy Dan McConnell, Chief Technologist at Booz Allen Hamilton focused on Bright Labs, which Dan gave a background uh, on to me when we were prepping. And then, of course, Mike just now. Dan McConnell served 10 years in the U.S. Army as an infantry officer. Thank you for your service, Dan. Big time. We know you're very passionate about that and those that, that, that uh, you protect. 
Uh, he's a master of science from University of Virginia, a master of public policy from Harvard, and he's a bachelor of science from the United States Military Academy at West Point. So hopefully you know that these folks are, are the real deal. Uh, let's go right to Raimundo. Raimundo, I, I opened up with some context. Introduce yourself a little bit, the little professional journey that you're on and why you're so passionate about it. And then Dan, the question will be for you as well. Thank you, Pete, Mike, and all the community for the opportunity to address uh, this amazing group here. So uh, I'm talking from Connected America uh, conference here in Dallas. So pardon if there's a little bit of noise here. And I started my career like you, like you mentioned in the telecommunications industry. So it's great to be here at Connected America because we are connecting the dots, you know, between broadband and quality of life and hope and opportunities for all the community, for everybody. How broadband and this kind of smart city infrastructure and technologies really can power hope and opportunities for everybody, for underserved communities and for the youth and for everybody who wants to find a, an, an opportunity to grow and to have a career in this field. So I, I started 30, 30 years ago with companies like Siemens and Motorola and Bell, Bell South. And for 10 years or more, I worked um, building urban infrastructure at that time and intelligent systems for fault tolerance. So when I joined City of Corregues in 2004, my first experience in the public sector, I said, well, maybe I will join for three, for three years. So three years became 18 years, an amazing opportunity Opportunity City of Corregevos is in the center of Miami-Dade County. We are the home of the University of Miami, and we have a, we have a vibrant community with a lot of challenges because you know more than one million vehicles commute through Corregevos every week. So we have a lot of issues related to traffic and re, and of also being a coastal community in Florida, we are vulnerable to hurricanes and natural disasters. So all those are challenges. And we, I, I brought that experience from the telecommunications industry and that entrepreneurial and competitive mindset also from private sector to building an, an amazing team. So we have a team of 25 uh, people here in the innovation and technology department. We have engineers in all the disciplines and experts. And we have been working very hard, first of all, to help our city to have a robust infrastructure that can survive hurricanes and can provide critical services for first responders and public safety. And after that, building those intelligent connected infrastructure systems like IoT and digital twins and smart city hub platforms to uh, bring other value now to the stakeholders. So that happened after we uh, took care of the basic needs, building that capacity, infrastructure, cybersecurity that allowed us to grow up to this level. Ramundo, I just want to highlight for those who heard, I mean, amazing story. And I know you're as passionate, uh, not just evangelizing, but but explaining, delineating uh, why smart cities are not something just happen overnight. And as I jump over to, to Dan here, I, I heard you talk about urban infrastructure, right, which is critical infrastructure where we live, fault tolerance, uh, addressing natural disasters, man-made, and those that happen, we usually learn a lot about why were we so at risk and we didn't know? And that's where I think in our IT community from AI to machine learning to the cloud, we wanna and have an opportunity to, to be better prepared. So resilience I know is a key word and we'll get into some of that with your use cases. So thank you. Dan, your turn. Great, no, thanks Pete. Uh, uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak here today with everyone. Um, excited to talk about sort of my past uh, and some of the work that we're working on. I think it uh, relates really well to kind of what Raimundo was walking through the city of Coral Gables and what everyone here is interested in. Um, you know, I had an interesting uh, path bringing me here to this uh, career in technology. Uh, you know, 20 years ago when I graduated from West Point, uh, we were a country at war and I was a young infantry officer and technology was not really my focus. It was more just about the uh, service and being in the military and didn't really think long term about what I wanted to do. Fast forward about 10 years and, you know, I got into consulting, commercial consulting initially, uh, where I was working with a lot of tech firms within the Beltway, helping them figure out working with the federal government. Uh, you know, this is 10 years ago, there was a lot of legislation coming out uh, and I had just, you know, finished a degree in public policy, but was really focused on the technology side and the intersection between tech and government uh, and really acquisition reform and how we, uh, as a government, are acquiring new and emerging technology. And so as I was helping these tech companies uh, with that, you know, I decided I wanted to be more hands-on. And so that kind of brings me to where I'm at 
at Booz Allen, uh, you know, now. So I started out uh, doing large enterprise modernization, uh, really getting my technical skills up and learning about how this works in the in the government. But now what I'm working on uh, within the, the chief technology office is this new organization where we spend a lot of time prototyping with emerging technology. Uh, and a lot of it, all, although, I, you know, Know, as a smaller compared to a 30,000 person organization, we're a smaller R&D uh, uh, organization, but we're working really well together. And what resonates with, uh, you know, smart cities to me, uh, someone who focuses on DOD uh, primarily as my client base, I hear installation of the future. Uh, you know, the, uh, hundreds of these military bases across the country uh, require the same things that, you know, a city, a smart city like Coral Gables uh, requires. Would love to talk about some more examples about that, but really spend a lot of my time thinking about different emerging technologies such as like IoT, AI, machine learning, uh, digital twin technology, the metaverse, and, and really how that all comes together and is integrated to provide these services to citizens, users, uh, et cetera. Well, that's wonderful. And I, I love the focus on mission, obviously, in your your DNA, that that's where your career started. And, and I think a lot of people in the Beltway where I grew up, so I can say this, and having worked in government, uh, there's a unique mission in every agency and then within each agency. And we all know technologies can solve problems, folks. And for our audience, we know most of you on here too, probably work with these companies who could do integration work and provide us and sell into. But it's, it's, it's conversations that matter so that we can enable public safety, right? Or to ensure as best we can, knowing there's always risk. So, so Dan, I love that. And acquisition reform and R&D organization, I love it because coming from the DOE, that whole, and what all of our infrastructure, you know, is about now and the, the laws and legislation, understanding what's written down, but the impact and outcome is what we're here to celebrate today. So Raimundo, let's jump back to you. I mean, let's get right into it. Uh, I mean, clearly you're, you're ingesting a lot of technology and, you know, from digital twins to AI, I'm going to assume everybody on the audience is Googling terminology and knows what some of it means, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about the process of, you know, corralling the right people, making the investment in certain technologies, staying current on things that you buy today and that is outdated tomorrow. I mean, because this, this journey to make Coral Gables a recognized smart city didn't happen overnight. So tell us a little bit about that challenge, but boy, what an energizing opportunity it's been for the city, because you've clearly been recognized as one in the country that's the best of the best. Thank you, Pete. So I will go back to 2004. So when I joined the city, I was welcomed by a series of Corrigans. We had a, a lot of Corrigans, some of them category one, two, and three. And besides the damage that we under, under, underwent, uh, for the high-speed winds, um, we lost power throughout the city. We lost all communications at that time. The carriers were not as resilient as they are today to those events. They don't have all the cows and all the infrastructure on, on hand to survive those kind of events. So we lost all communications, even for first responders during the worst uh, uh, periods or the worst events of those winds. So uh, coming from the telecommunication industry, to me, that was immediately like a red flag that we had to build that a uh, high-speed communication uh, bro bro broadband layer that had fault tolerance and resiliency to survive organs. So we started building a multi-layer uh, found foundation. Uh, started building our own fiber optics where we didn't build, we leased, and we started connecting all our major buildings and fire stations and remote stations and all the community centers with broadband, with fiber. Then we built uh, as a redundancy uh, our own gigabit point-to-point -point and point-to-multi-point uh, wireless network throughout the city. So we had that redundancy. And we also got the redundancy from the metropolitan internet, from the PSTM, from, from AT&T, in that, in that case, as a third layer. And on top of that, we had that, at that time, uh, we had carriers like Nextel and Bell South, where I came from at that, at that, at that time. And Bell, Bell South became part of AT&T later. And later we have other players that came to the picture, but they were not as many as they are today. And remember, we were talking about LTE, early LTE at that time. And the, the bandwidth was not as robust to connect buildings. So, but that was a layer of connectivity. And on top of that, we built a satellite uh, network also, capacity with rapid deployment kits, because when everything fails, uh, we have satellites. So, and that also was leveraged in some cases. Uh, recently, when we, had, when we provided mutual aid, 
to the Florida Keys after Hurricane Maria, where they lost everything. Our mutual aid uh, firefighters, they came with handhelds with satellite connectivity. And when we deployed our mobile command center to Lee County and Fort Myers after recently Hurricane Ian, uh, uh, we uh, powered it with the SpaceX um, satellite connectivity from Star Starlink. So we we leveraged satellite satellite as the last resort. So those were the years when we were building that capacity, building a network from scratch. The city didn't have too much of a network in at, at that time. So we uh, built also the human capital because you need the experts, you need the talent that is going to build, maintain, and operate that infrastructure, and is to have the expertise and the knowledge and the industry certifications, uh, the uh, to be fiber technicians and big C certified type of uh, low low voltage uh, techs, but also the systems engineers, the electrical engineers, the people that are going to build and put all that together and maintain it, make it sustainable. So those were the years. After pretty much like 10 years with uh, my focus at that time, once I became the assistant CIO in 2012, it was to build a st standardization leveraging standards from the industry, uh, from uh, like from ISO 9000. So, you know, I have that hat as a PMP and also that hat as a Six Sigma black, black Belt. It's about processes. It's about building operational capacity. Thinking as an industrial engineer that you are building a plant with a complex operation. You need to have, think about the life cycle, but you also need to think uh, on the financial side. How are you going to sustain that from an economic sustainability standpoint? What are the capital plans? Uh, that are going to also build the budget to uh, for the total cost of ownership of that infrastructure over the over the years and the operation. So after we worked on standardization and we did a Lean Six Sigma uh, process improvement throughout the city to improve the processes be before bringing technology. Because if you bring technology to a wasteful process, then you make the process worse. So you, you make it worse. Basically, it's improving the organization, improving the culture of the organization improving the processes city, city, citywide. Then we, we brought the technology to it with enterprise systems. We started building IoT networks in 2013. So after we took care of ICT, uh, information and, com and communications technology, then we went to the next phase, ICI, Intelligent Connected Infrastructure. That's where we started building all uh, that from the, all that layer of smart lights, smart lighting controllers, traffic sensors, environmental sensors, air quality, water quality sensors. Then we started building a community intelligence center where we aggregate all the data from CCTV and license plate readers. And we started seeing the ROI. So like lowering crime more than 40% in just two years. Talking about 2015, 2017. Lowering traffic accidents with hyper automation and hyper connectivity of systems and also data that becomes actionable insight for fair responders, for police and fire for decision makers, uh, for uh, traffic engineers, design safer roads now with all that data and insight that we are bringing to them. So we started building all that infrastructure and connected uh, clouds now that use artificial intelligence and machine learning to make sense of millions of data points. The only way you can process that big data, that big data coming from all th that cyber physical networks of, of systems. So we process that with AI, and we present that value now to our digital twin and our smart city hub, where it can be consumed, democratized to the citizens, to the public. You go to coragebos.com slash smart city, and you see all the open data that we can share from sensors, from systems, all the apps, yeah. all the information that can leverage uh, economic growth for businesses or uh, public safety for responders or the public in general. So that's a long, long story short, but that's the journey so far. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I'm going to give you your uh, question after we pivot over to Dan, because Dan, I want to have you riff off like that is a perfect example of a journey that a city said, where do we start? And, you know, Ramundo, from the leadership you need to the trust in folks letting you, allowing you to make decisions, building the right team, you know, high speed broadband, redundancy, resiliency, building from scratch, human capital, love that. People process technology for all our enterprise architects out there. The audience listening. When you market your stuff, say, to the government, to the agencies, think about what Raimundo just hit on. Map a capability to a need. And it's not just, I have a solution, I have a box, I have a router, I have a switch, I have a sensor. It's what we're going to get into with Dan here in a minute. So, uh, Raimundo, thank you. The question's going to be for you and Dan after this, because I know, you know, we could talk for hours on this. Folks, you can go 
Google Raimundo's name and, and Gartner and IAAA and see some great case studies of him talking about the nuts and bolts. So please do that. Uh, Dan, you heard this, right? Digital twins, bright labs. You all are like to me where the puck's going in addition to kind of where it is. Can you talk about the application though and the promise of these technologies that help maybe accelerate those challenges Raimundo faced 20 years ago? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was like um, a tremendous breakdown, Raimundo. Uh, re it really resonated with me. I think, um, you know, w one similar example that, you know, is really close to what I'm working on now on the team. Uh, and like you said, Digital Twins, Pete. Uh, so a similar city, another Florida city, just up in the Panhandle and actually an Air Force base, Tyndall. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with uh, Tyndall Air Force Base, uh, largely destroyed during Hurricane Michael in 2018. Uh, and so there's an example of don't really have a choice, uh, got to start kind of everywhere uh, and we got to rebuild because it's uh, not just an Air Force base. I mean, it's um, uh, families live there. It's everything from school, housing, uh, groceries, fire department, local police to uh, the world's most advanced stealth fighter jets, right, uh, and conducting operations. So um, coming in with a number of partners and a whole host of industry partners, uh, thinking about how do we build, uh, you know, a smart city or an installation of the future. Uh, and so taking a lot of those, those uh, things that Raimondo was working on over years, and we kind of had the, the ability to start with a clean slate almost. And so where we started with was a digital twin, because once we were able to, to create a complete one-to-one -one replica of the physical base, which was not easy, by the way, we can go, we could probably talk for hours about uh, meshing together, you know, all the different BIM models, the terrain that we had and, and figuring all that out. Once we had that, that data, um, really tons of use cases just started popping up and, uh, and it, it just escalated very, very quickly for us. And, you know, we talk about what we work on in Bright Labs uh, in a prototyping uh, kind of organization. When you have a uh, real life digital twin uh, of a uh, of a whether it's a building or an entire Air Force base, the amount of just like modeling, simulation, experimentation you can do uh, with you know digital IoT, uh, with running AI and different models, uh, you know we're still building this is a large seven billion dollar, uh, eight billion dollar over eight years sort of effort that's being undertook down in, at Tyndall Air Force Base, but the ability to just kind of do weather studies, uh, do storm surge uh, modeling and sim for over the next several decades and integrate that into all of the construction. And then Raimundo, you know, you talk about process, we created a, a, a 3D real-time integrated master schedule. So no more Excel spreadsheets and, and just looking at lines, but you can actually experience the construction as it's going up. You can identify dependencies faster. And really, uh, you know, when we get back to the people and process aspect, which I, you know, foot stop as well, getting all those stakeholders who are critical to get into these large, really expensive infrastructure type uh, efforts to get all their buy-in and the public, because it's public money, you know, at the end of the day, whether it's a city or the federal government. So, so Dan, um, first of all, audience, please write in questions. If we don't get to them, I'm sure our colleagues, when they're not talking, maybe answer a question, but we're trying to leverage, you know, your attention span, but use the Q&A. Dan, you hit on, I mean, obviously, thank you on digital twins. And folks, Google the term, you probably know what it means, but modeling and simulating stuff that might happen, that technology alone is amazing. Ramundo talks about hurricanes. We see it on the news. Bad stuff happens. What do we learn? But sometimes you can't predict. Some events, the tornadoes that happen instantly, 300 mile an hour, people die. Hurricanes, we may project it for days, weeks, and we're still not prepared because nobody's saying, should the levee be built on mud or should we have had reinforcement? We don't know. And that's where technology is enabling us. So again, technology is not the problem. It can help solve. And uh, I loved the insulation of future phrase. And I loved going back to my man, Raimundo, hyperconnectivity and making sense of millions of data points. And additionally, the Intelligent Connected Infrastructure acronym, ICI, I'm going to use that and I will give credit to you, but I love it. That's what this is about. Big picture, it's not easy. Anatomy of a smart city takes a lot. Raimundo, we hear about barriers facing smart cities, IoT. I'm going to throw some terms out, but I want you to riff off some of this, what you find to be critical. And you're talking to people who sell into government, who have products, but also probably could do a better job storytelling and having conversations that matter to understand your specific needs. Data privacy, security, critical infrastructure challenges, citizen engagement. These are considered you know, key performance indicators. And then governance, once this stuff's all up and running. 
Go talk to the city of Pittsburgh. You don't just put a sensor on a traffic light and say, we're good. But some of the barriers, security, privacy, interoperability, you hit standardization. What are some of those barriers and things that you fight every day so that you can make sure that it's not a product that's going to fix that, that, that issue? Those are great points. And none of them can be an afterthought. They all have to be part of the ideation process, part of the conceptualization of any new project, of any new service. So we're talking about privacy, security, compliance, accessibility, very important, inclusion, and also uh, all the things that have to do with governance. And to me, something that is very important, interoperability, because you don't want to bring a, you don't want to solve a problem and create 10 new problems. So, and problems can be because we are creating a new silo or a new system or infrastructure that doesn't communicate with the rest of your systems and infrastructure. This is why we have, and uh, if someone wants to read more about our frameworks, you can go to coragables.com slash ITDOCS, ITDOCS. That's our smart city digital library. There you will see our eight smart city strategic management frameworks. And one of those frameworks is the systems engineering interoperability model. Basically, it's horizontal integration across all functions in the organization in a way that we guarantee that we have that interoperability, that integration, communication between all the systems that we introduce, old and new. For example, asset management, land management, uh, public safety, all those systems need to have interoperability and they need to have a common ground for governance. They need to follow all the things that have to do with risk management, detection, protection, technology, infrastructure management, and also a response management and compliance. We are a highly regulated agency. So we undergo more than eight audits a year from PCI to PII to CJI. So if, if you wanna know what those acronyms are, if you work in uh, security and data assurance in government, you know about criminal justice information data, you know about protected health care information data, HIPAA, you know about PCI, you know about all those things that you need to care. And you know about protecting personal, personal identifiable info, information, the privacy of the citizen. So you have to be the steward, uh, the protector of that privacy of that data. So take that very seriously. That's why we have to have that as part of the ideation process. It has to be embedded in the fabric of the organization. That's why the first thing that we did was to create those eight interconnected strategic management frameworks that go from infrastructure to project management to interoperability between systems, to uh, industrial engineering and operation management, and quick wins are very important. Everything we do has to have quick wins, a high ROI that the citizens can touch. So as we have a vision, and we go from vision to planning to execution, we also have a strategic realignment. We have to listen to the voice of the customer, the voice of the citizen constantly to uh, adjust those strategies. But as we plan, we execute, so we cannot have analysis paralysis and plan for a long time because things are moving fast. And every technology that we do, every project is a strategic project. It has to align with the needs and priorities of the citizens and also the strategic goals of the, of the organization. That alignment has to happen all the time. With those eight frameworks, we do it and that takes care of all those different things that you mentioned, Pete, and they are embedded in that fabric. So Raimundo, and for the audience, again, I, you know, this isn't easy. I, I know you get up and eat, sleep, and drink your city. It's not, yes, we are now a smart city. I'm going to take a break. And uh, no, it's, it's a constant effort to keep people informed, understanding the value. And, and, you know, I think, Dan, coming to you, there's the excitement and opportunity uh, of what a smart city can be. And we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. That's, that's the most important, equity. Right. You know, every city like where I live, I got more shopping mall, Wi-Fi and access to information than I need. And I still look at charts where you could find there's still no Internet access in our nation. And it's not easy to build that infrastructure. Think about our, our tribal communities in Alaska, for example. It's not easy to cut through ice and to lay wire. That's why we're looking at satellites. Dan, again, riffing off of Ramundo. you know, digital twins, bright labs, the information that is being collected. How are you? Uh, able to distill a lot of that information and help your customers, you know, think about here's the promise, but there is always going to be risk. Yep. No, that's a, that's a great question. And I uh, agree with everything Ramundo was saying. I think one thing that I think about, you know, especially 
as it pertains to you know the type of digital twins I'm talking about, real time, 3D data, uh, beyond even uh, and 100 percent agree on the cybersecurity of all these different types of data types that you know we're managing in, in a city or on an ins a military installation. Uh, so even beyond security uh, and data protection, I think of trust. Right. And and getting the trust of whether I'll use user or citizen, you know, interchangeably. But um, uh, the, the real value in these platforms and breaking down these silos, uh, you know, is democratizing the data so that we can find additional use cases. But, uh, and so, you know, as a you know a producer of a, a digital twin and a smart city or a, or an installation of the future, a lot of the data that I'm gathering or relying on is actually coming from the citizens or the users themselves. And so not only do they trust the data is accurate, do they trust that it'll be valuable for them? Are we providing value or are we just like wasting time? So really getting back to human-centered design, earning the trust of the, the, the end user uh, or the citizen. Uh, and I think that increases the fidelity uh, of uh, the ability to the people in the process using it. Uh, and then from there, use cases, you know, abound and people want to come in and, and leverage the data. I was looking at the Coral Gables, uh, you know, website and looking at how you could even like the um, uh, just going around on the street map view and, and being able to access different types of LIDAR data. Like, you know, a citizen can look at that and think, you know, I might create an app leveraging that data that could be like a public works app or, you know, uh, and, you know, you read stories of that happening all over the place. So it's really great to see, uh, you know, I'll say it again, democ the democratization of the Coral Gables data, uh, because I think that just inherently, you know, adds value as well. So, so uh, we've got six minutes before I tune off, hand the mic back and Rob and team do the great stuff, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Rob, by the way, shooting out some links. Uh, I'm going to ask Ramundo and Dan, put some hyperlinks out in the chat regarding bright labs and, you know, use cases that, that that's facts tell stories sell. All right. Uh, Ramundo, um, you know, when I think about what you have on your plate every day and the opportunity, um, I've heard the word human a lot in our conversation. I love this voice of customer, human centered design. We use it like it's a phrase like, yeah, we talk to people. You talked, and Dan, about horizontal communication. So I want people to leave today, and this is my preliminary parting shot. Man, it takes a lot. It takes a village to move the needle incrementally. There is no short, quick fix. We got Dan talking about what Booz Allen's investing in with Bright Labs, like a lot of companies to, you know, where are we going? How are we going to get there? What are the risks? Ramundo's dealing with, you know, people are saying, not in my backyard. I don't want that RFID sensor. It's going to give me cancer. I mean, not that he said people said that. I'm just saying I hear this all the time. But there is a trust that needs to be established, whether you're selling something into the government or you're just hoping people believe you understand their plight. So that's my context of what you folks have been talking about for the last you know, 38 minutes or so. And, and I appreciate it. And I hope the audience is understanding that because we are all human beings at the end of the day who have day jobs, whether you sell, whether you ideate whether you vision you go home at night and you have some semblance of family extended or right there that you care about and them being safe so raymundo um give us that vision of the future where where do you see your your activities going what do you need from industry how are you working to collaborate more and you know leave the audience with something that that they can you know you know chomp in on or chomp down on it and be excited to reach out to you. And same for you, Dan. Well, we continue building the capacity to empower the community, especially to solve problems of today, you know, about traffic, environment, coastal resiliency for us that live in South Florida, all the things that really matter for the citizens, continue to align with those needs and priorities and critical needs from our community, continue growing our ecosystem where we have from professional organizations like this one, like this great community that I'm, uh, I have the privilege to talk to today, with universities, academia, the ethical uh, uh, model where we have academia, industry, and government, and nonprofit organizations all working together, building an ecosystem with the community to solve the problems of today, but also build the amazing dreams and capacity of the future. So we are building, for example, a more smart district fiber corridors to provide digital literacy programs to the community partner with universities, creating techno parks, upskilling training for digital literacy to help the businesses also to join the digital economy. 
to help the young students to get micro credentials so they can get jobs uh, 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 when they when they will leverage technologies like AI, IoT. So we are creating those capacities. We are building those training centers. We are connecting the community and we continue growing. So that is the, the, the future is bright and we are kind of like paving the way for that. Well, you're the man and two things. Good luck with your University of Miami Hurricanes. I forgot to mention that. That's big news down your neck of the woods. And and honestly, uh, Ramundo, I, I get to work with you in the Global Cities Teams Challenge. I, I, I am, you know, your passion's infectious and we're birds of a feather. You're the man. I appreciate you being on here. We know you're a busy guy. Uh, keep being the connective tissue officer that you are. All right. Love you like a brother, man. Dan McConnell, give us some parting shots and perspective from today and what, what you think could be done to enhance that trust with government and industry. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And uh, I thought this has been a great conversation. I mean, I think there's probably a, a million things I could say. The primary thing for me, you know, and, and something that I've been striving to do, you know, inside the Beltway within a large federal contractor is uh, really to, you know, have conversations like this and get outside of our own sort of uh, bubbles, whether it's at the city, state, local, federal level, uh, and really connect with like-minded folks like, like this. So I spend a lot of time uh, you know, when I say I'm experimenting and prototyping, it's usually with lots of partners, whether it's like new startups that I'm always like interested in, in bringing in and exploring different ways we can work together, uh, or other uh, adjacent uh, organizations, I, you know, I was just thinking I was just at South by Southwest. Uh, and we Booz Allen had a huge like activation uh, during that show, if you're familiar, but it's like not a traditional DC show, but we had like a very federal government uh, uh, pr perspective that I think was interesting for a, you know, a non-traditional show. Um, and so getting out there and, and talking to people who aren't normally a part of the conversation and being more inclusive of all these good ideas and emerging tech uh, will just be helpful for everyone. So would definitely be interested in connecting with any and everyone uh, if you're interested. Well, we're glad to have you part of this community. Congrats on Bright, on what Bright Labs is doing and emphasizing that voice, that community, that constant translation that's needed. Uh, okay, so look, I was honored to do this and always am fired up to have you in this this discussion that is relevant today and will be tomorrow. I'm going to pass it back to my good buddy, my other brother from another mother, Mike Burkholz, and then we'll uh, we'll give it back to Todd and, and Rob. Thanks, Pete. Um, I just want to, again, thank uh, Dan and Ramundo for taking the time today uh, to be with us, talk a little bit about what they're up to. Um, you know, certainly in my role um, at GSA, uh, seeking to uh, build our own capacity and our learning about what others are doing, um, understanding what the new technologies are coming um, out, not just, um, you know, across the commercial spectrum, but also, as Ramundo talked about, what's coming out of the labs, what's coming out of academia. Um, you know, those are the types of things that, that we're looking at to understand what is coming out there, because, you know, those of you that are on this group know that the acquisition cycle in the federal space is long. And one of the ways to shorten that is for us to catch those uh, those particular technologies as they're being developed and start to understand these potential use cases and think about, uh, you know, how we might do that. So, you know, this meeting and, and others are important for us to, to get that information. So, um, again, thanks to Dan and Ramundo uh, for their time. And thank you, Pete, as always, for moderating and uh, and being the co-chair on, on the working group. Um, well, th thank you. And I, I just saw that, you know, Ramundo is running to another one, but Ramundo, you know, thank you again, Dan, big time. Thanks, Rob, if I can, before we pass it back and, and feel free, if you all need to drop off, coming back to, to what Mike and I do with Don and, and Sam is we are always looking for this kind of story. We can quote, we can reference, we can put a white paper together and pray that people even read it, much less the first page. But these are the stories. These are hearing it from Ramundo and Dan, who are industry and government at various levels. And there's a greater good here, right? The federal government can do only so much. And you're selling not into an agency audience. You're selling to those that the agency serves. And we have 420 some agencies with a unique mission. And each of us go homes at night, goes home at night, hoping our water's clean, our air's clean, our lights turn on, the food we eat is safe. There's no quick fix. So with that, thank you to all of you. And until the next time, and engage with our group. We'd love to have the ideation sessions.